Andreas, welcome to Real Vision. It's such a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much, Ash. It's a pleasure to be on the show. Yeah, you know, Andreas, it's actually kind of interesting. Uh, in 2017, uh, when I first joined Coindesk, I was very interested in cryptocurrency as an asset class. Uh, and after I'd been there for a few days, one of my colleagues took me aside and said, you really need to read this book. And of course, that book is the purple book that's on top of your stack right there, Mastering Bitcoin. And it was really the beginning of my journey uh, into the technology. It was the rabbit hole that I went down. Uh, so it really is, uh, it's terrific to have you on this show. Thank you. So Andreas, tell us a little bit about your background. You're, of course, uh, your background is in computer science. Uh, you've done a great deal of um, security research, even prior uh, to your interest in blockchains. Tell us a little bit about your journey and how you got started. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a geek. Basically, uh, I uh, got my first computer when I was just past 10 years old, and my life became that. Since I love technology, I have a fascination with computers. Um, I fell in love with them at age 10 and I never stopped. It, it was what I was meant to do. And um, so I, I eventually managed to get into a university and uh, I graduated from the University of London with a master's degree in data communications, networks, and distributed systems. So my focus was always on distributed systems. Uh, this was very early on in the development of the internet, which effectively was the distributed system. And uh, I just happened to you know, be in the right place at the right time. Um, this was in the early 90s, and already I was interested in cryptography. And uh, uh, obscure applications of cryptography, I always saw cryptography as an interesting way to implement social change, governance, political goals, um, and in a movement which is now known as cypherpunk. Um, so I was interested in the writings of the cypherpunks back in the 90s. And at that point, they were experimenting with digital currencies based on cryptography. This is uh, obviously uh, almost 20 years before Bitcoin. And these things paved the way. I was interested then, I got involved. I met some of the early pioneers in that space when I was a student in London. Um, and then I worked in information security and uh, managed to be busy enough to miss the first couple of years of Bitcoin. And then in 2012, I read an article about it. It was related to a site for gambling. I completely dismissed it and thought, this isn't for me, not interesting. And then um, I read another article about it. And this time there was a white paper attached. I read the famous uh, white paper by Satoshi Nakamoto and it derailed my life. Like it literally derailed my life. I dropped everything. Um, I switched from being a freelance consultant. I was doing uh, a bunch of work in cloud computing and distributed systems and information security. And I was like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this and nothing else. This is going to be my main focus, which at the time was not a profitable decision. In fact, <laughs> it was a crazy decision. It was a leap of faith. And, um, and I started working full time, even though nobody wanted to pay me to, to do anything of the kind. <laughs> um, burned through all my savings and um, established my work in that space. And then two years later, this came out. I've never written a book before. Um, wrote my first book. Now I'm writing my sixth um, book. And um, the rest is history. Andreas, what was it that you connected to at such a visceral level when you read the white paper? What I connected to was I understood immediately that this was not just money, uh, but uh, a platform, specifically a very decentralized distributed system that enabled us to do something that we had never been able to do before, which was establish trust across vast distances without coordination, um, trust without a central authority. And of course, if you have a network that enables you to um, to conduct some kind of transaction with another person um, with complete trust in the system without having to trust that other person, without having to even know that other person. The obvious first application is money, um, but that's not the only application. And so then that seed immediately started branching out and blossoming into a thousand ideas um, that just washed over me. 
and and I I spent the next four months obsessively reading, writing, coding, um, and consuming all information. Uh, like many people, I think in the beginning, I was very skeptical because it was like, okay, this is very elegant, very interesting. Surely there's a catch, right? There is something here that I'm missing. So I went at it. I'm going to debunk this. I'm going to find the weakness. So I started reading the source code. I'm like, okay, you can't break it that way. Uh, let's try this way. Oh, you can't break it that way either. And just kept hammering at it with every possible angle that I could come up with. You know, I trained as an information security professional in attacking systems and finding their weaknesses. And I attacked it ferociously. And after months of doing this, I finally managed to kind of persuade myself. Uh, this is a hell of a lot deeper than I thought. It's more elegant than I thought. It's more robust than I thought. And this could go a very, very long way. That's a wild story. That's so cool. The idea that you jumped in trying to break it and debunk it and found, uh, nope, it's actually the opposite. I'm still trying to debunk it. I, there, there's always this little voice in the back of my head going, there has, right, there has to be uh, a catch. I still approach things with skepticism. I don't assume that this is meant to succeed or that it can survive every form of attack. It's just that it's, it's, um, it has this right balance of incentives and disincentives. Um, and these robust features that make it survivable, like the internet, and that mean that the community that's built around it can react to different forms of social attacks, economic attacks, political attacks, legal attacks, uh, and of course, technical attacks, and shore up the system. And so over time, I've become more and more confident. And of course, you can measure that confidence in terms of um, how much money is sitting in the center of the table that has not yet been stolen? So 10 years ago, I could say, oh, how robust is the system? Well, I think it can, I think it can secure $100 million. How do I know? Well, there's $100 million sitting in the center of this table protected by nothing else than smart cryptography, and it's still there tomorrow. Therefore, no one managed to grab it. Well, now that conversation has reached a point where you say, oh, there's a, a trillion dollars sitting in the center of the table. The reason it's still there isn't because no one has tried to grab it. It's because everyone is trying to grab at it 24 hours a day for 12 years and failing. And if you see that, it creates a level of confidence, right? These systems are robust because they are continuously stressed, or as uh, Nicholas Nassim Taleb says, anti-fragile. Um, they thrive through adversity, they uh, adapt to attacks, they evolve to defend. Um, and we've watched that in real time. Hey, if you like this clip, be sure to check out the full interview and more only on realvision.com forward slash crypto. It's 100% free. Sign up now.